Thank you so much to our panelists for just joining. Um, we have lots of people joining us today from around the world. We've already heard from people from Dublin and from Massachusetts, California, and New York. So happy to have you guys here today. Um, our panel is a little broader than most. So we have a lot to cover in 45 minutes, but we had some great questions submitted from the audience and um, we came up with a few good ones. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, for people that are just joining, I'm Ali Brandenberger. I'm co-founder and CEO of The Bridge. We are an organization that is nonpartisan, breaking down barriers between professionals and tech policy and politics and trying to build community there to increase empathy and understanding of, around the issues in tech policy. Um, and we've been partnering with All Tech is Human for a couple of years now, and they've been great partners, and we're so excited to have the summit happening today. Um, and then thank you so much to all of you guys for joining us, making this panel possible and the discussion. Um, I'm going to jump right into the discussion and let each of our panelists, um, if you guys, Malcolm, Cassandra, and Emma, could just say your name, your title, and your pronouns. And then what, if you could maybe also kind of wrap into that how you would define the meaning of responsible tech and how it relates like in the, to the work that you're doing right now. And we'll just kind of prime people to know what you're doing in the space. Maybe we'll start with Malcolm. Well, thank you, Ali. Um, and thank you everyone for joining. It's really great to be a part of what I think is gonna be a fantastic conversation. My name is Malcolm Glenn. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I am uh, an organizational consultant who spent a bunch of time over my career building policy partnerships with corporations, nonprofits, and governments. Um, most prominently, and I think most relevant for this conversation is I am the director of public affairs at a company called Better.com, and we're a digital mortgage startup, um, and I do some work advising companies on communications efforts, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to be here. And, and again, thank you, Ali, for um, uh, your thoughtful questions, which I'm sure we're going to have over the course of the next 45 minutes. Um, listen, I'll try to be pretty brief, but responsible tech to me is really about taking, you know, sort of the principle we hear a lot about related to inclusivity um, that is often applied internally around things like recruiting and, and the demographics of our employees and who's in leadership at companies. And really, it's about applying those principles outwardly. And for me, that is, it's taking the questions of inclusivity and recognizing that they don't stop at the sort of proverbial water's edge, that uh, all of those efforts are insufficient if they only look internally. And true responsible tech is really about integrating the impact of platforms and products, um, or sort of interrogating the impact of products uh, and, and platforms when it comes to output. So really asking yourself how equity is truly integrated into everything a company does. Um, and uh, it's very aligned with the principle that uh, is really important to me called inclusive design, but I actually even think responsible tech goes further. It's not just a look, it's not just about looking to make sure that everyone can use your product, but it's really about making sure that your products work for everyone um, as effectively as they possibly can. So I'm really excited about this conversation and to dig more into what that definition truly means. Awesome. And Cassandra? Sure, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm, my name is Cassandra Madison. I'm VP of Partnerships at the Tech Talent Project. And at the Tech Talent Project, we're um, a small nonprofit that's really focused on increasing government's capacity to deliver uh, services better to deliver critical economic and human and policy outcomes through technology. And the way we do that is by focusing on people. So uh, some of it is helping government leaders understand why it's so important to have folks with modern tech expertise on their teams. And some of it is actually building a bench of modern technical leaders from the private sector who are excited about serving. Um, and so I come to this maybe from a little different angle than a lot of the speakers you've heard from today and really thinking about the public sector and tech and what it means to deliver and manage tech responsibly in that sector. Um, and so for me, when I think about government and government is a huge buyer of technology, it has historically been a builder of technology. It can help, you know, it's purchasing decisions can drive the market. It regulates technology. And so really bringing a lot of the concepts that you all are talking about here um, around inclusivity and human-centered design and diversity need to be infused in government. And I think it's something that we don't often talk a lot about. 
Um, and I just, I don't see a world in which government works for everyone unless there is a seat for everyone at the table in government. And um, technologists are a big part of that equation. Awesome. Um, and Emma. Hey everybody, um, I'm Emma Lykin. I'm the chief of staff um, of the responsible tech team at Omidyar Network. And um, just to build on some of the points that Malcolm and Cassandra made, I think underlining inclusivity as, as for me and I think the team that I work on, a quite a critical value um, underpinning this whole broad idea of responsible tech, as well as um, the importance of engaging an array of stakeholders, one of which is, of course, government and public institutions. Um, I think kind of getting at the idea of responsible tech at a higher level, one thing we talk about at Omidyar is how can we, on the one hand, maximize um, the benefits of technology, the convenience, access, um, and then on the other hand, how can we foresee risks? How can we mitigate harms um, that arise from technologies, companies, the ecosystem at large? And so we're really, I'd say one thing the team that I work on is really focused on is this harm mitigation piece. Um, we have, you know, we're, we have tech optimists on the team, more skeptics, and we're thinking about both building better technology and also instead of move fast, break things, like move slowly, anticipate risks, think about harms. Um, and so, yeah, and, and this idea, one thing that we talk about a lot is the, the Peter Parker principle. Um, so with great power comes great responsibility. Um, and we talk about the decision-making power that's housed in Silicon Valley and the implications um, this power has on democracy, markets, communities, um, our information ecosystem, we're constantly thinking about how do we offset that power and create guardrails. Um, and maybe I'll come back to kind of the, the topical areas we, we look at later, but we I do think about our work kind of at a high level across um, ideas, tools, and power. So thinking about how do we ask the right questions, seed new ideas, new business models in the tech realm, um, what are the guardrails and rules of the road and how do we inform them? Um, and then also how do we shift power and, and bring more, less homogenous groups into the conversation to the inclusivity point that Malcolm raised. Very excited to be here. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so, I mean, as someone who has built a company around bringing public and private together and innovation and regulation together, I fully appreciate the mix of people on this panel today. Um, but I guess one thing I heard a lot from you guys was the values that you see in responsible tech. So a lot of inclusivity, trust, optimism, but some skepticism. Do you guys have, are there any other values that you think shouldn't be left out of the conversation? Feel free to jump on in. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I think the, the, um, some of the ones we talk about in terms of inclusivity, inclusivity and transparency feel like a part of this larger value of do no harm. And that if both in the private and the public sector, when we're thinking about tech and tech development, if that was our primary value, I think that would be huge. And, you know, in the public sector, this looks like not building systems that cause families to wait three weeks or in the case of some of the unemployment crisis issues, months for, for the benefits they need. Um, in the private sector, it looks like building systems that, you know, don't propagate misinformation or exacerbate our country's mental health crises. Um, and, and that really starting from this place of do no harm and then applying the principles and practices around good modern tech development of human centered design and, um, and inclusivity and diversity uh, would really make a big difference. But that first, that first value needs to be non-harming in my mind. I think that's a really great point. I actually just want to build off something that Emma said, which I thought was really great. You know, there's this, you know, Emma, you mentioned this notion of move fast, break things right. And, and you know, you, you all think about it more deliberately. And, and relatedly, I think about a real value in responsible tech being about not necessarily moving fast or slow, but moving in a thoughtful way and really taking into account, um, as Cassandra alluded to, the the systems in place that, you um, that it's there's a responsibility for technology companies to not exacerbate in terms of areas of discrimination and 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 marginalization and what i always say is that i think the good news is that so many of the problems um you know we see 
technologies uh, sort of um, expounding upon are not new. The bad news is that so many of those problems are not new. Um, and, and I think a, a thoughtful approach understands that there are problems baked into every system that exists in this country. Efforts to intentionally discriminate based on race, based on gender identity, ability, geography, a whole host of different um, demographics. And so it is really important as a company engaging um, in, in, in technology in a new space to really understand the history of those systems. And you know, I work at Better. We're a digital home ownership company. It is imperative for us to effectively do our work, I think, to be aware of the bias and discrimination that has been baked in the history of housing for 400 years. Um, when I worked at Uber, um, we weren't looking to exacerbate issues of transportation inequity, but we had to really understand what pre-existing issues around that space were already there. And we had to think about what we were doing on our platform through that lens, you know, asking ourselves questions about why certain demographics were more likely to be closer to transit where the platform was cheaper. We weren't necessarily making it more expensive for people who live far away from transit, but let's look at and interrogate who lives in those spaces and what disparate impact we're having on those communities. And I think this applies across a bunch of different areas too. You know, if you're working in ad tech, look at the pretty egregious history of racism and advertising, both in the ads themselves as, as well as amongst the people are, who are making them. If you work in ed tech, learn about the discrimination in education and the fact that it didn't end after you know, a Supreme Court case said that schools had to be desegregated. And so for me, one of the really essential values in this work is a thoughtfulness and in, in particular a thoughtfulness around the history of the systems in which you're engaging because tech companies are doing lots of innovative work but they are not fundamentally recreating the wheel around how society operates and because they're building on something that came before i think it is just deeply deeply important that there's a thoughtfulness around that history and that can be a really valuable lever at least in my experience in terms of actually making those outcomes a lot more responsible that they would be uh, had that thoughtfulness not taken place yeah. Oh, Emma, go ahead. I was just going to tack on and, and say, I, I really appreciate that. What I, what I hear you saying, which is around like, you know, tech doesn't exist in a vacuum. And so it's informed by the social structures, the inequities, the institutions that we have around it. And so understanding the context, I, I really appreciate that. Um, to throw in two or three more values that come to mind that I don't think we touched on. Um, we spoke about inclusivity, um, which I think is critical thoughtfulness um, to, to the tech that we're building and, and how we deploy it. I also think um, something that shows up a lot for us at Omidyar is, is privacy and privacy being a, a fundamental human right. And then we also think about accountability, which I think is related to transparency um, to Cassandra's point, but it's like, you know, who, who are tech companies accountable to? Is it to shareholders? Um, is it to, you know, the rich and famous? Is it to the standard user? And then who is the user? So I think yeah. questions around accountability are important. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say creativity, because it's easy to take for granted the business models um, through which I think these companies operate, right? Like our data is mine, you have profit generated from ads. And so what would it look like to, to creatively imagine more responsible business models um, and more, more human-centered platforms as well? Um, I think is another value that I think about. Yeah, I mean, having people being able to creatively think about that, um, Emma, about how we can creatively think about responsible business models is really important too, because a lot of this stuff is moving fast and government has to keep working. We have to keep issuing, you know, how, like education grants and that sort of stuff. So being able to have people thinking about it in the background is really important too. I think Malcolm, building on what you were saying, yeah, all of this, none of this stuff is new. I mean, same with advertising and propaganda and all that sort of stuff, but it's moving so much faster. And one thing we talked about at a bridge event recently was um, how engineers and um, developers kind of need to be historians now. Um, <laughs> and know in a way like history is really important um, because these issues are systemic. So I fully appreciate what you were saying. I think one thing that I'm hearing all you guys talk about is the importance of, you know, the innovation and the regulation, the legislation, the constituents, the people that are using the tech, all of those people being included in the design. Um, one, one of the questions that we got from a bunch of people before the panel was kind of how do you, 
how do we ensure that that community is continuing to be built? I mean, obviously it was spent today, um, but kind of in practice, I guess, you know, I think it's really important that in government, in private, public sector, you understand kind of those values and where the private sector is coming from and vice versa. Um, and at the bridge, we obviously work to kind of break down those barriers. But do you guys have any examples of where you've seen this in practice and it's been successful? I think for some people, it's helpful to kind of, you know, have an example and build off of that maybe. I could offer up something, which is to say, um, I think in the realm of breaking down silos and getting more cross-sector engagement to, to move the needle here, um, something that I'm particularly passionate passionate about is around um, engaging young people in you know, the responsible tech discourse, not just through the lens of child safety, which is of course critical, um, and we need to center that, but also thinking about, you know, young people are the future, they're stakeholders, they're also creators and, and makers of tech. And so I think one lever that I've seen be used in the realm of breaking down silos, cross-sector collaboration, um, is actually starting at a more formative educational institution level, so university curriculum. And so something that Omidyar had funded and supported, along with some others like um, Schmidt, Craig Newmark, Mozilla, a year back was the Responsible CS Challenge. And the push was thinking about, okay, how do we integrate ethics, humanities, um, philosophy courses with computer science courses? And so I think if we start that conversation early and then the young people entering the Responsible Tech Pipeline or these tech or government jobs have that more nuanced, um, historical to Malcolm's earlier point, understanding of the issues, we won't have, it won't be as challenging in terms of people speaking such different languages and being so siloed at a later stage. So that's one example I offer. I love that. And I'll just add that um, I've been fortunate enough over the course of my career to spend a lot of time working in particular with the disability community, working on how we can create more inclusive tech solutions um, for people with disabilities. And there's this really phenomenal saying um, that I just repeat over and over and over again that I learned from some disability advocates. And it's nothing about us without us. And it's a really integral part of the way that disability advocates approach their conversations and engagement with folks in the tech world and quite frankly, folks in the corporate world more generally. And I think it speaks to a sort of foundational principle of how you facilitate this cross-sector engagement is real pressure from the advocacy, the external community in order to get companies to engage with the folks who both have the historical perspective as well as the current um, sort of present day lived experience. And, and I think part of the reason I think a lot of that needs to come from the outside is because right now I just don't know that companies have the right incentives to try to facilitate this, or at least they don't think they have the right incentives. Some of the things that I've heard over the course of my career are leaders and companies talking about how, you know, bringing these folks together for these conversations is great in a vacuum, but it's a distraction from the growth of the business or the need to innovate to beat competitors uh, or the day to day running of the company. Because at the end of the day, you know, I think it is worthwhile to have a conversation around what we think are are the sort of stakeholders to whom these tech companies should be accountable. But I think they would say that it's their shareholders. And I think when they see um, things that they feel like are distractions from that ongoing, you know, never ending commitment to shareholders, um, they tend to dismiss or at the very least devalue the importance of these conversations. And so I think it is really, really important for organizations like All Tech is Human to work to kind of push companies to go outside their comfort zone and bring people together in ways that they otherwise wouldn't. I also think we have an opportunity to really put pressure on some of the real big funders in the tech space, um, philanthropists, you know, you see CEOs of big tech companies always talking about what they want to do with their money. Well, you could actually think about how they could reinvest their money back into the ecosystem in order to make sure that they're creating opportunities for conversations like this to happen, particularly because a lot of those CEOs, of course, have made their company in ways that haven't been super equitable. Um, and then, you know, I would just say, I, I love what Cassandra said at the very beginning. Um, let's really think about the role that the public sector has to play in facilitating a lot of these conversations as well. Um, 
the value that you have from the public sector is if they say that you need to do that, then oftentimes that's the only thing that's going to get things done. So um, I think it could happen at the federal level, state, local level. I think that's a separate conversation, but I really do just like the idea of really kind of asking more of our public sector leaders in terms of spurring these conversations um, within the, the tech ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah. And just to piggyback, I think on, on some of the bright spots in government, look, look, government has a long history of troubled technology rollouts. Um, and I think looking back, you know, healthcare.gov was a pretty significant wake up call that spurred a lot of changes in at the federal level, at least in the way they think about the delivery of technology. And there's some real success stories that have come up out of that with the creation of the United States Digital Service. Um, 18F, which helps uh, governments, you know, do better procurements for technology. Um, and these are all pipelines for early, mid, late career professionals to, to come in for a tour of service in government um, and really help government think but differently and in more modern ways about how they deliver technology. Um, and I will say that it's not just about getting technologists into government. It's about getting technologists into government that understand humanity. And so, you know, we look or things like it's, you know, there's lots of people who understand technology, but who are the people that understand technology that have humility and curiosity and a passion for making the world a better place. And my sense is that there's lots of people out there who feel this way and are interested in this kind of work and just don't know the pipeline in. Um, I think, so I think there's been quite a bit of progress at the federal level. You know, they, um, there was just a new announcement about the digital service core, which will be for folks coming right out of school um, and and I think there's a great opportunity to bring that to state at the state and local level too. And so there's states that are also standing up their own digital services teams and things like that all across the country. Um, and so I, you know, you'll hear me be a broken record about how important people are, the right people at the table, um, for this to, to sort of move technology in a more responsible direction and in the direction of the public interest. Um, and I think there there are a lot of promising stories out there about that building that pipeline, and we need to we need to grow it and strengthen it. Yeah, Cassandra, the more inclusivity at the table or inviting people to the conversation to be part of it, inclusive design from the beginning in government, I think for those in tech or business is similar to you know people in the C-suite or inclusivity and um, equity in board levels um, or just senior levels and retention, that sort of thing. So, but it is interesting that the different languages that people use, but shout out to one other program, Tech Congress also brings technologists into Congress. So if you wanna be on that side of the government, um, there are tons of them um, and it is a really great group of people too. And it's awesome to see more technologists kind of like understanding the language of government. Um, jumping quickly into one other question that I know has come up a bunch before the summit and then also I'm seeing a little bit in the chat, but in terms of um, being inclusive of people with disabilities that are invisible, um, how, how can responsible tech include those folks and, and take that into account or technology, government, et cetera? Is that just kind of the same ways that we've been talking about so far or do you guys have any other? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, when I have engaged in some of my disability advocacy work, um, I think a lots of disability advocates feel like there's sort of a marginalization of that group in the context of broader conversations around inclusion, right? You know, um, people with disabilities are oftentimes not sort of the first people brought up in some of those more macro conversations. And I think folks with disabilities find that frustrating. I think to your point, Ali, people with invisible disabilities find it doubly challenging to really make sure that their um, their feedback is taken into account, um, that products are made with accessibility for their um, for their experiences in mind. And so um, I think the way that you you fix this is to and this, this is absolutely more work. You know, when you're building a product, this is going to make the product lifecycle longer. Um, you know, to Emma's point, you're going to move slower, but I think it's the right thing to do, which is again, to have those conversations at the formative uh, part of the design process. And the thing I love about inclusive design is, um, it takes into account that feedback so that you're not having to go back and retroactively kind of retrofit 
a product for a specific experience. One of the reasons I think um, a lot of advocates from marginalized groups feel like they are um, sort of dismissed in conversations around tech is because they bring feedback to platforms and platforms say, well, it's really hard to fix now because we've already launched or, you know, we, we've already built code in such a way that it's going to require tons of work to kind of go re back and fix it. And that's not wrong. I think that's an accurate description from folks on the tech side, but that's a problem with the process well before we got to the point where we are now. And so um, I think to engage with, uh, to, to effectively build technolo technological solutions that are really going to serve the needs of everyone, including people with invisible disabilities, you need to have those conversations at the very, very beginning. And so I think it almost is a fundamental rethinking of how we think of the product cycle, right? You know, there are all these internal conversations, there's some building, uh, there's some more building, there's some iteration. I think you move the conversations with the people with lived experience across a disparate, um, a, a sort of a diversity of um, communities. I think you move that to the very front. And again, it's going to slow things down, but ultimately I think it's going to produce significantly better outcomes and actually be a better process in the long run in terms of actually serving these people, particularly these people who, for whom it's not obvious what the what their need might be, like people mm -hmm. with invisible disabilities. I think that's a great point. And, um, you know, one of the things I found in Vermont in my prior life, prior to doing Tech Talent Project, I um, spent a bunch of time in government service, surprise, um, but uh, it, trying to remake the way we deliver technology in Vermont. And I think in the case of public services, it's also recognizing that technology is not a panacea, like it's not going to solve every access problem. And mm -hmm. so I agree 100%, Malcolm, that um, you need to put these conversations on the front end. And then if you're trying to deliver a product or service, think about it more holistically. Um, you know, one of the things we found in Vermont was that, um, you know, we were building some products that allowed people if they had to verify their income or their citizenship, et cetera, um, you know, they could take a picture with their phone and they could um, upload it to what started really it very simply as like a secure inbox. But it kept people from having to go walk in the door, you know, drive 30 miles to an office or having to put something in the mail, find a place to photocopy it. Um, and the the technology itself was really helpful for people like working single moms, for example, who didn't have to take three or four hours off of work so that, you know, they could go to drop off their paperwork. But it also freed up space in offices for people who just needed in-person support. Um, or people who had advocates who had to walk in the door to help them with something, translators, all, all sorts of things. And so it was just a big lesson for us that, um, especially in the service delivery side of things in the public sector, like technology doesn't necessarily need to solve every problem. And you want to start with how do people, you know, how do people consume these services? How do they need them? Um, how do we meet them where they are? And there are a variety of different ways that you could do that, some of which involve technology, but not all of them do. I would just add in to underline that point around, you know, we there are systems and solutions we need to brainstorm beyond just the, the tech piece um, to bring in a global example around digital identity, which um, was an area that I worked on before joining Omidyar. Um, in the context of Aadhaar in India and understanding um, India's biometric digital ID program that has been applied to um, public services, social welfare, um, in particular, the public distribution system where um, below poverty line folks get rations and they, they verify with their fingerprint that's linked to their digital identity. And so it's touted in many ways and hailed as this development solution. Um, and in many ways it has made in public service, public service is more efficient in this context. And yet you have scenarios in which, you know, there are connectivity issues in rural areas or people's fingerprints are blurred because they're working in manual labor or because of age. And so you have to think about, okay, beyond the tech solutions, how do we account for mm -hmm. other lived experiences here? And so I think that's definitely top of mind for me as well. Yeah, I think a lot of it, I mean, I think you guys would all agree, is also not putting the burden on those people with disabilities to make this happen. Um, so I don't, I feel like a lot of what we're talking about is big, big systemic change that needs to happen and like kind of counter a lot of systemic problems from before. But 
in terms of going forward, I do think that more people are talking about this now. I, I feel like it is becoming more of a mainstream conversation. Obviously this group that's on with us today, while being a lot of people and global is kind of like, I, I forget who mentioned it before, but kind of us talking in silos, like we understand the problem. So then it's kind of like getting out of there. Um, but wondering, you know, I think one thing going forward that is definitely going to be true for companies at least. And I think, I think government has kind of been held to this before, but good intentions are no longer going to be enough. It's going to be real harm that's caused and fast and quick from tech or just, you know, so how can companies kind of anticipate the consequences or what are some of the emerging risks that you guys see and how can they like mitigate those, mitigate those harms of the products? Kind of a broad question, but. I'll, I'll flash something up here because it, it relates a bit to what Malcolm was talking about in terms of the product life cycle and, and how to integrate a thoughtfulness and kind of a stop and go when you, when you do see harms arising, which is to say, I think one lever um, in terms of making products more responsible and responding to what you spoke about, Ali, is around culture. Yeah. Um, and so that's really beyond. So there's the piece around getting a less homogenous group of makers, you know, people with diversity of lived experiences who, while the burden should not be on them to always alarm bell, if and when they do alarm bell, because maybe they foresee harms arising from products, they're listened to, right? I think that's that's one piece. And there's been a lot in the media over the past year or two or around this. But I think there's also something that's more nebulous at the cultural level at companies. And I, I say this having, I worked at um, Google, so in big tech before joining Omidyar. Um, and I think having mechanisms and forms through which to actually imagine and almost using future sensing tools to think about, okay, what are the potential harms of this product or how could this be misused? So that it doesn't, you don't have to be the one lone wolf at the end who says, hey, not mm -hmm. to everyone's flow, but by the way, this this could happen and this is bad, but having a toolkit for checking in as you go and, and future sensing. And um, there's something called the Ethical Explorer Toolkit, which was funded by um, Omidyar and a couple others. Basically a scenario building kit where you have eight cards ranging from surveillance to data extraction, privacy issues. And you can kind of integrate that into a product team or a UX research team so that culturally you have this baseline of language and space to flash things as they come. Yeah, I, I really love that point um, because and, you know, I also worked uh, in big tech, uh, including at Google um, <laughs> years and years ago. Um, and I think Emma's exactly right. You know, there are people at all of these companies on all of these teams who are thinking about these things, who are really taking a thoughtful approach to trying to be responsible, but sometimes it's one or just a couple of people on a product team. And it's really challenging when the project is moving forward and everyone's trying to meet these deadlines and everyone's trying to beat their competitor uh, to a launch for you to be the one person to step up and say, well, hold on, maybe we should take a beat and consider what impact this is gonna have on X community. And so I think that's exactly right. You really need it to, you really need to build it into the culture so that everyone is thinking about this and this is a sort of formalized step or set of steps in a product launch process you know one of the things when i was uber that i worked to try to advocate for internally um, was to include an accessibility check in each product cycle and so when we were putting together the templates for how we would structure um, a, a, a product process let's make sure that there's a very clear accessibility check and that accessibility, among many other things related to external communities, can serve as launch blockers. So people don't see this in some way in conflict with getting the product out the door and you know meeting their key performance indicators and ultimately being successful at the company. But they actually see this as very much integrated into that success. Um, and how you change that culture is really challenging. Um, I think it's a whole lot easier for people who are thinking about the the building of new companies now uh, it's a lot easier to do just like so many other things we've talked about when you seed it at the very beginning uh, but in the absence of that i think you need real senior leadership buy-in to push for that cultural change because ultimately people are 
working to try to be successful in their careers. And if they feel like doing this, calling out ways in which companies aren't being responsible is going to be disadvantageous to that career progression, it's a whole lot like less likely they're going to do that. And the way that it gets prioritized and, and, um, and um, appreciated is by leaders really aggressively pushing for that cultural change, which is challenging, but I think it's something that you really need to have start to come from the top in order to effectively change that culture. Yeah, I totally agree with that, Malcolm. That was the the point I wanted to just um, reinforce is just the senior leadership piece. And one of the big markers of progress in my mind will be when we start seeing um, leaders who are thinking about this and have expertise in these areas at the helm or at the executive level in their companies. To me, that would really show that both cover, government and companies are like, are, are not just performative or, you know, or just using words to talk about their investments in um, do no harm and equity and justice and all these things, but that they're actually changing the culture of their organizations. And so it's senior leaders that are empowered that are so critical. Um, I also think that on the government side, you know, we've touched a little bit on the regulatory piece, and that's certainly um, a lever that government can use to turn things from um, good intentions to action. And uh, I, when I look at government, I just see a real deficit of, of leaders that understand where technology is going, understand the implications of this, you know, think about this in AI and all sorts of other things. I know there'll be more conversations on this this afternoon, but um, that we really need folks at the senior leadership level in government who uh, can think through how to regulate technologies effectively to, to reduce harm. And once we start seeing that, that pipeline grow a little stronger, I feel like I'll also feel a little bit more um, confident in, in intentions turning to action. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you, Cassandra. Having, being able to, having leaders that can regulate effectively to mitigate harm, but also um, that do so when there's not a crisis. <laughs> I think a lot of things, like a lot of what you see in government or kind of even with tech companies and their response to certain things or why they do certain things or why a lot of these ethical checklists are built is similar to, you know, cyber years ago, and we're trying to get people to understand it, but just the, you know, there's a crisis and there is an, a pressure from someone to work on the issue immediately, or it's impacting a part of their business that they care about the most. So I think responding when there's not a crisis will be also maybe another marker in the future of a way that we've <laughs> made progress. Um, but I think also having senior leaders, um, Cassandra, you said something about senior, you know, having people that are thinking about this stuff at the senior level that are empowered, I think is really important um, because, you know, you can, it's kind of similar to retention. You can have the people coming into your company, but keeping them and having the commission. Um, I think all the points you guys made are super important. And I could talk about this for hours and of course go into regulation and the international implications and how we don't kind of double down on our efforts. Um, I want to, before, I, I want to keep us on time because everybody else has, but we do have five more minutes. One, I have one question kind of just about the international component, because I know we do have a lot of people tuning in from around the world. We've talked a lot about how kind of the system in the U.S. needs to change. Um, do, how are you guys doing any work on the international level and how do you kind of see that changing in the future? Um, and then I have one final question for all of you guys before we end, but Emma, it seems like maybe you're wanting to chime in here. <laughs> yeah, love, love the question. Um, so I think um, I'm, I have a background in international development and particularly interested in some of these tech policy issues in the South Asian context. So that's, that's where my enthusiasm comes into play. But I think there's this balancing act or challenge that I often think about, and I think others, at least on my team, do too, which is, on the one hand, we do need some global internet governance across issues, and we need, you know, conversations across leaders and activists and advocacy folks globally on, say, content regulation or data privacy or competition policy. Like, I think these are global issues, but I, I sometimes see risks as well in terms of importing these blueprints that we have in the US or the UK onto other countries, global South countries who are also leaders in tech in their own right. And in 
pushing our own blueprints, our own agendas, and thinking that we can just map them onto any institution anywhere, I think about potential harms that could arise. And so I'll give a tangible example, which is around um, India's recent IT rules. And so I think what could be flagged as this is great government accountability <laughs> um, activities on behalf of the Indian government in terms of oversight for platforms, right? We, we could tout it as that and, and view it as a win. But from a human rights perspective, I, I also think about, okay, well, why is it that the Indian government wants traceability mandates on a platform like WhatsApp? Um, and, and so I think being conscious that these issues exist in different contexts across the board and that leaders in these specific contexts are the ones that should have, have the mic speaking to them broadly and figuring out how to have a collaborative discourse um, globally on this, I think is really critical. Malcolm, Cassandra, do you guys have anything you want to add on that point? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it does get really complicated, but I know we have some folks working internationally, so um, feel free to put it in the chat or connect if you guys want to talk about that further. Um, my last question, we have three minutes left, is um, a lot of people here are joining today because they want to learn how to build a career in responsible tech. Um, also, I think just generally how to connect with people. I'm seeing a lot of conversation too about Kind of feeling like it's a lonely journey when you're you know trying to make all these changes um but there is a great community here there's also a great community at the bridge um and so if you guys have any other questions i mean any other advice for people that are trying to build a career in tech um i'd love to finish on that point just as kind of an action item for folks sure i can jump in first um i would say and someone mentioned this earlier really uh, if you're thinking about getting into responsible tech particularly at certain companies Take a look at those company business models, really ask yourself whether you think that those companies can and are making those business models work in an equitable way, because sometimes you can see some of the inequities just based on the models that companies are putting forth in order to actually grow their business. Um, and, um, and then I think it's also important to ask people at those companies what their values are and to ask those tough questions before you're involved in an interview process. Um, you know, certainly while you're involved in an interview process and really look for that business model value alignment. Um, if it's not there, then it might not be a worthwhile uh, endeavor to undertake. And then uh, to to just harp on a previous point, there's lots of good work, and this might seem odd at a, at a convening like this, but there's lots of good work that's not in tech. And so tech is not always the solution and recognizing that is, um, I just think, uh, a really, really important um, thought process to take in mind if you're leading sort of guiding principle really is I want to do the most good or I want to do something that's of real value to society. Yeah, um, I would say one, I think you're having a presentation. One of the one of the 10 minute discussions this afternoon will include a bunch of different organizations um, that are doing work in the early to mid career tech pipeline yes. into government. So if you're someone who's interested in civic tech, public interest tech, um, definitely tune into that. There's um, really a huge ecosystem out there of organizations that uh, will will welcome you with open open arms if you're interested in a career in government service related to tech or just interested in a tour of service. Um, the need is just so high. And when I think about what our country's experience, just looking at COVID, uh, you know, over the last 18 months here, um, the difficulty people have had in getting their unemployment benefits or small businesses and getting loans and um, the difficulty we've had in getting data on what's even going on out there, which really hampered our response. Um, it's, we're at a unique moment where you can really see the real world human impact of doing tech poorly in government. And so we just need folks who are both technologists and on the tech adjacent side of things that can be a part of the conversation, be a part of the design and delivery of, of efficient, effective services. Um, and then certainly if there's anyone in the audience that is saying, hey, I really wanna do this. I just wanna talk to someone. You're more than welcome to reach out to me directly. We have an organization you know, that can, that can connect you to the right people um, or support you ourselves. Yeah, and I'll be happy to share any event. I'll share all of your guys' information in the chat later. And that group that you mentioned, Cassandra, is PIF, which is a group that we didn't mention before. So I'm happy that that came up. <laughs> Marissa is going to be talking about the Presidential Innovation Fellows later. Okay, Emma, quickly before we go, 
just two quick resources that I would say is that um, All Tech is Human and The Bridge both have responsible tech job boards. So feel free to go on there. Um, and then thank you all so much for joining. Um, Emma, let's hear your advice. And then we'll pop off so that David can stay on time. <laughs> Yeah, um, reinforcing what Malcolm and Cassandra said. Um, and I, I think a forum like this is just great to get people in conversation and to build build a network around these topics. Um, just like from a tactical perspective, I'd say coffee chats. I mean, people are still pretty much at home. And so um, I think it's, it's, you know, you can reach out to someone, ask them about their work, their story, um, make, build kind of a, a repertoire of, of people that are in your corner that maybe they see something later that aligns with your interest, they flag it to you. Um, I think a lot of people are keen to pay it forward um, in that way. And I'd also say I use Twitter in terms of keeping up with these tech policy conversations. It's, you know, like I create my lists and I, I use it, you know, to get some of my news. And of course, we have to be you know, cognizant around our information environment there. But I think it's a it's a good resource. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is there are groups of um, young folks convening tech policy people in conversation. So I would shout out um, Jasmine at Reboot is doing a lot of great work. Um, and then Alia and Lujane at Multiplicity. And I'm very happy to connect with folks after um, and even intro them to, to those people. All right, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining. Um, the bridge is thebridgework.com and I'm on LinkedIn, Ali Brandenberger, happy to connect with you guys and connect you to each of the speakers. Whatever's easiest, get on the chat. Don't be shy. Just everyone here today is asking other people questions and genuinely just getting involved. So um, no, no action is too small, um, but thank you again and um, enjoy the rest of the summit.